Okay, I'll give it a gentle start, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll let people continue to uh, trickle in at the virtual back. Um, I'm Adam Hug, I'm the director of the Foreign Policy Centre, and I'm delighted to introduce what is the third in an on-running series of events that the Foreign Policy Centre is doing with CEPAD, uh, the Sectarianism, Proxies and Desectarianization Project at the Richardson Institute for Peace, uh, which is part of Lancaster University. And this is the third year uh, we've been collab uh, sort of the third series we've been collaborating with uh, uh, with 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 CEPAT, um, uh, possibly even for I think more years now that we've uh, gone on through COVID and everything else. But uh, we're delighted to continue that partnership. And as I said, this is very much um, in a series where we are trying to learn lessons across peace, different peace building situations. Um, there are two examples that we have looked at uh, so far in Lebanon and Bosnia, where you have you know, a, a legacy of uneasy peace, but it is peace that still exists in some form, um, result of power sharing and different forms of, 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 of systemic and, 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 and other forms of cooperation uh, that have enabled those countries to move out of conflict into, in, into the situations they find themselves now. The next two events, this one and the next one, are for conflicts that are still very much unresolved and, uh, and, and, and very ch deeply challenging. Uh, none more so than the topic that we're looking at today, which is the situation in Syria. So our topic today is building a lasting peace, power sharing and sectarian identities in Syria. And that's a, that's a, a, tough, a, a tough challenge. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, you know, a, a very difficult state to play on the ground, ongoing humanitarian crisis, a regime that's reestablished control over much of the country, uh, but very little legitimacy and, and very little trust uh, on the ground. And, and as you said, an ongoing uh, humanitarian situation both inside and outside the country. And I'm delighted to be joined by people who know far more about it than I do. Uh, and uh, in turn, we are going to hear from our speakers, Rahaf al uh, Abdul Hadi Ali Jalla, um, Bilal Sakar, and Al McGovern MP uh, from the uh, Friends of Syria group in Parliament. So, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Rahaf al to uh, start today's discussion. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Adam, for uh, this introduction and thanks to Foreign Policy Center and to CIPAD Project for inviting me uh, today to talk about such a very complex topic. Uh, first of all, let me start uh, saying that uh, I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to solve uh, uh, this kind of complex by theorizing why power sharing is a little bit difficult to be imposed on Syria, on the Syrian case. But um, I mean, uh, it's it's all it's well known now. Like it's such a complex and hard topic to discuss amid an ongoing conflict that does not um, seem to end soon. Um, let me start with emphasizing that the questions of how to build peace is intimately linked with how to end a civil war, uh, and one of the mechanisms to end the civil war is power sharing, as suggested by many scholars such as Lidgeberg, Rosini, and Barbara Walters. But um, the question here: Can power sharing prevent from reviving the conflict, this is one question, or whether power sharing indeed is possible in the Syrian case. Uh, my presentation today will be limited to the following question, to what extent power sharing can resolve the, uh, the, the Syrian conflict, uh, or whether power sharing is uh, at all possible when it comes to Syria. Um, actually, answering these questions will take me to explore different phases of civil wars, the proxicization of the Syrian conflict, uh, and here it's also pertained to, uh, to the role of external actors and how do we define peace and stability. And last but not least is, uh, is exploring the agency of the Syrian people. I mean, because this webinar kind of connects sectar sectarian identities with the possibility of power sharing in the Syrian context, there is a need to explore two concepts that dominate the Syrian scenario. One is legitimacy, two is weak state. Of course, we cannot ignore that the fact that the impossibility of establishing power sharing stems from the party regime's refusal to share power or to negotiate with the challengers or opposition groups even before 2011. 
So, and, and, and the regime's reluctance to share power stems from its lack of legitimacy. This is not exclusive to the Syrian context, but shared widely among other Arab states. With lack of legitimacy, weak state systems pertain to historical uh, enforcement of the Middle East system under the Ottoman rule, followed by a divide rule strategy under the French mandate, and then followed by robust militarization of states uh, after uh, Syrian, uh, the, the independence of Syria. Then Hafez al-Assad came to power where he instrumentalized religion and sect, particularly in order to maintain authority and stability. All of these factors had contributed to the break of a civil war that did not start because of an anti-regime demonstrations, but also because of the nature of an authoritarian regime that lacks legitimacy, instrumentalized sectarianism, and, uh, and used ideational and militaristic force to keep control. Now, a weak state system is defined by lack of representation and lack of consent to an existing policy, uh, to an existing polity. If this was the case before the break of Syrian uprising in 2011, which made it impossible for an authoritarian regime to share power with others, this brings me uh, to, to, to define actually or to ask what, is, uh, what does civil war mean? Uh, or, or the different phases of civil wars since uh, World War II, and the solution to end the, civil, uh, the Syrian civil war through using uh, power sharing. So just to give a background to the different types of civil wars and to relate it to how civil, uh, the Syrian civil war has its own complexity and particular, uh, particularity, um, here like I, I want to refer that, that unlike interstate wars, where they end with negotiated settlements between 1940 and 1990, 55% of interstate wars were resolved at the bargaining table. However, only 20% of civil wars reach similar situation, which means uh, that there is very difficult, uh, uh, it's very difficult for civil wars to end with negotiated peace or with, with, uh, with negotiations. So what the first civil wars from interstate wars is that civil wars uh, always, uh, the, 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 the fighting parties always choose to fight till the end uh, in, because of, of like they, they seek survival or uh, they seek survival. And this brings me to the role of external actors in ending the conflict. So before discussing how external actors in the Syrian case plays a negative role because of conflicting interests and different uh, uh, of conflicting er uh, interests, let me state that the fighting parties in the Syrian war are all fighting for survival. And here external supporters of all sides treat the conflict as a zero-sum game with far-reaching and for some actors existential uh, consequences for their own strategic positions. Therefore, uh, uh, determined to prevent any outcome, these external actors, they always prevent any outcome that, that, that would regard, uh, that would be regarded as disadvantages for their own geopolitical interests. Uh, the, imp the impossibility of power sharing or even establishing peace lies in our understanding uh, um, uh, of, the of, of how the proxicization of the Syrian conflict uh, has taken part uh, since, uh, since uh, uh, the break of, of, of this war in 2011. So uh, here I must refer to the logic of war by proxy. So uh, because all these warring parties in Syria uh, have been receiving open support from external actors, uh, um, the conflict has acquired the character of a proxy war in which international, regional, and subnational conflicts are fought uh, uh, are being fought. Uh, the actors here treat the conflict as a zero-sum game where success for one means uh, automatically a defeat for the other. So this contentious interpretation and enforcement of international norms with the United States and other Western states backing the Syrian opposition while Russia and Iran support the Assad regime with protection and the trade. Uh, and also not the least, Moscow is re re resisting the application, of, uh, the application of the principle of international responsibility to protect. Um, at the same time, the Russian-American rivalry over zones of influence echoes the patterns of the Cold uh, War. Therefore, the Syrian conflict has actually introduced a new Cold War. Uh, but above all, and here I must refer to the regional actors, especially, especially Gulf states, uh, the, which, which have perceived that the Iranian expansion in the region post-2011 invasion of Iraq can be minimized and contained through uh, their uh, intervention in the Syrian conflict. So from the perspective of the Gulf states, first and foremost, Saudi Arabia, the Syrian crisis offers an opportunity to reverse Tehran's considerable growth in the regions. 
Now, in terms of the mitigating conflict, since the beginning of the crisis, um, international actors actors has initiated conflict mitigations in the country. Like in 2011, the UN Security Council called for implementation of the G uh, of Geneva talks. Uh, the Arab leagues also, along with the United Nations, also tried to putting significant efforts efforts in combating violence. Yet the clash of interests of these uh, 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 external actors and the lack of political will combined with the underestimation of the power base of the regime and the strengths of the opposition actually made it really impossible uh, to build a comprehensive peace process. Now, in the wake of the failure of such measures, including uh, the aggressive measures of the regime uh, that were employed uh, uh, in the beginning, some scholars have insisted on the necessary of the, on the necessity to make a way of uh, to constitutional uh, democracy. Now, I must pose the questions about the primary objective of power sharing, which is about a grand coalition among the leaders of different groups. Now, um, while many scholars have argued against the possibility of reinstating or applying power sharing in Syria, such scholars such as uh, uh, Stephen Rosaini have argued otherwise. According to Rosaini, Syria could implement power sharing if it could learn from the experience of Lebanon. And here, allow me to disagree with Rosaini's theoretical application of the Lebanese model as power sharing in Lebanon helped end material violence but not maintaining peace or stability in the long run. So uh, this brings me to how the regime's domestic policy over the last five decades have homogenized Syrian communities, preventing any chance of cultural pluralism. So we are in a front of a total lack of cultural experience of accepting the other. Uh, uh, of course, this goes to the regime's unitary nationalist approach, which has neither embraced sectarian and heterogeneity, nor can build a political system based on civic notions of citizenship. Furthermore, given the ethnic and sectarian composition, the territorial fragmentation, the socioeconomic cleavages, and multiple belief systems, which at the same time makes it difficult for a power sharing to be implemented. Some of power sharing mechanism lists segmental autonomy, and here I am referring to the theory of segmental autonomy, which ensures that all the groups have the right to self-governance in addition to recognizing mutual difference between the groups. Now, if we are to draw lessons from the Lebanese model or the Indian models, the most important thing is to highlight that there is no reliable external actor that can enforce end of this civil war or even enforce sharing power among the, uh, the fighting parties in Syria. Furthermore, since the Lebanese experience with foreign involvement and transnational loyalties dis disturbed the power sharing arrangement resulting in fragility, the process power sharing should start with Syria looking inward and assessing its inherent weakness rather than depending on external agencies uh, um, to rescue from the destruction of the war. Now, and, 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 and here beyond the concept of power sharing, and for me here to emphasize Syrian agency, we ask whether Syrians are happy, are happy with having power sharing among the regime, SDF, or even HTS. And here I cannot but refer to some recent publications that suggest uh, suggest delisting Jolani. I'm aware that there is actually not enough time for me to go deep into how dangerous such suggestions for the future of Syria, which kind of imply creating a state within a state and having to deal with warlords that commit uh, uh, atrocities against the Syrian people. What is indeed cannot be ignored that power sharing won't build a lasting peace, but aggravate the, intractabil the intractability of the Syrian conflict and will further deepen the fissures within the Syrian community. Meanwhile, also contribute to the emergence of sectarianized identity. So then the question is how to end the conflict if there is no political will. There is currently actually no uh, legal basis for a military intervention, and the, and the UN Security Council is unlikely to pass a corresponding uh, resolution. And anyway, the actors that would be capable of such complex and highly risky military operation is, is the United States, which to date shown no willingness to do so. So because of the logic, uh, because the logic of war by pro pro proxy, as I, I have described above, makes military victory for one side uh, is just as unlikely as negotiated solution 
which means that the continuation of the uh, of the Syrian of the Syrian civil wars yeah. of the Syrian civil wars will, is expected. So this difficulty to impose power sharing is also pertained to how the Syrian conflict has exposed the entrenched struggle over regional leadership and influence. So the in, for and, and here we have to take into uh, uh, into consideration yeah. the Iran nuclear program rivalry between the United States and Russia, China, and also uh, in, in the Kurdish question is in in place. So um, in conclusion, just one minute. It's quite obvious. I mean that I have not offered answers to how to end the Syrian war, but I I, I, I mean my my position here is rather to complicate. The possibility of having a power sharing imposed on the Syrian conflict. There is a need to emphasize that any scholarly attempt to draw parallels of other models where power sharing was implemented does not necessarily mean that this can be applied on the Syrian case. As the Syrian case proves that the drivers and motivations of its external actors are very contentious and complex. So I, I would I would just uh, in one in, in two seconds. I think that scholars and policymakers should rather ask how Syrian communities can reinstate trust, establish transitional justice, and prevent warlords from ruling Syria again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rahaf. Um, there's a, an awful lot from that to unpack, and I will definitely do that in the Q&A section afterwards. And I think there'll be a lot of opportunity to build out from some of those points that you've started. Uh, as I said, I don't think anyone is coming here today expecting anyone to have an immediate answer that will fix everything uh, automatically. So it's a, but we know it's important to think these, these challenges through. Um, without further ado, I'll add, uh, hand over to Dr. Abdul Hadi Alijela. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, um, uh, Rahaf, um, for this um, uh, uh, valuable input. Um, 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 in, to build a lasting peace in any society, in post-conflict societies and time, we need the trust. And here in my presentation, I will focus on um, uh, trust in divided society and Syria as a divided society. And one of the most important things and building on what Rahaf, Dr. Rahaf just said about the uh, other models in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Lebanon, and even Palestine, these kind of agreements and in post-conflict and conflict time, considering we are talking about uh, an ongoing conflict in Syria, um, um, th there is um, uh, it's a kiss fall cases. Uh, in Lebanon, we are still suffering. In Palestine, it's so, it, it has advanced to a colonial settler state. And then in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the situation is not good. Um, and, and I think you had uh, a session on 9th of February. Um, and and um, so I want here in my presentation to stress on rebuilding and building the humans of, 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 of in post-conflict societies. That's the most important things. Um, the models that uh, has been implemented before was on no, no liberal economy and the economy and on material uh, uh, construction. And, and it has failed utterly most of the time. Um, and, um, and here to start, I, let, let me cite Yasin Hajj Saleh. Um, and, and when he said that even the Syrian uh, society was um, disintegrating before 2011, um, it was dissolving already. And that's because of the politicization of the whole society and the, uh, the, 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 the oppression that people were uh, uh, um, subjected to. Uh, and here we are talking um, based on Saleh, a different Syria, the Syria of al-Assad, as he called it. And then you have the Syria of the revolution, which is, has diminished now. And then you have the Syria of the uh, autonomous regime administration in, in, in Kurdistan, uh, in um, Rojava. And then we have the Jabhat, Syria of Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamist groups. So we are talking about multiple Syrias within own Syria. And that's exactly what uh, Dr. Rahab just said, which Syria, it's state within a state or not. So what, uh, yeah. And, and, and the failure of the uh, Syrian state before 2011 uh, to, to, to treat people equally um, in, in culture, politics, uh, services, and so on, um, have resulted to make this uh, 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 a pluralistic society in Syria to, um, to be a decisive uh, fact, divisive uh, factor. And creating um, uh, what I call is a polarized and a spy society. And, and before 2011, um, members of each of the same family were scared that one member of the family could be member of the Mukhabarat. So um, to this limit, it was so uh, intense. Um, and I'm here not um, when, when I refer to the 
uh, different sects. I'm not referring to sectarianism in Syria. Actually, there is no sectarianism in Syria even uh, after 2011. It has been sectarianized. It has been uh, exported to the to, uh, outside um, uh, to be sectarianized by the regime and also by uh, foreign actors in the region and outside uh, uh, the region. And here it's um, it, it, in, in post-conflict war, when we are talking about lasting peace, we need to talk about the trust. Trust one, trust between people themselves, uh, generalized trust, and then trust between people and the institutions and trust within uh, uh, sects. Um, uh, and, and here, let me give you a bit of, of the uh, Syrian uh, uh, Center for Policy Research uh, um, uh, survey conducted in 2014. And they say that um, trust um, has diminished utterly. Uh, it was already low before 2014. So now in 2014, um, who said um, they trusted people always um, have uh, decreased from 15.6% to 5.8%. And then who said they trusted people usually uh, diminished from 64% to 26.7%, which is a huge. And I mean, here we are talking about a catastrophe, a catastrophe in terms of rebuilding humans and regaining the trust. And this is related to the uh, different factors. One of them is uh, related to the, um, uh, in the, the level of violence in, in, in some areas. So the more we, we have a very um, positive association between the level of violence and um, low trust. So areas where um, uh, 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 violence was so intense, they have low trust between each other. And, and this is um, a need to to, to, to be considered when we talk about lasting peace and post-conflict uh, reconstruction. Then the second factor is the feeling of security and safety. In Syria, we don't, we, the people don't feel, even in cities like Damascus that um, was under the uh, Syrian regime and people were feeling more safe than other areas, I mean, compar uh, to compare with, uh, um, they uh, expressed annoyance by internal displaced people so um, somebody from the regime who come from Deir Zor or even from Idlib and move to Damascus, people Damascusian, I don't know how to say it, Damascusian, uh, people of Damascus, they didn't feel safe. They usually say, why, why people? Like, we don't feel safe because those are um, foreigners, strangers are invading Damascus. So, and this you can also measure to other areas in, 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 inside um, uh, 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 the country. And uh, the third uh, factor is the, which is really uh, talking of, uh, being uh, spoken about is the demographic change in Syria. Um, we don't talk about, we don't hear much about it, but there is a kind of demographic change. Um, the country is not uh, anymore that, like 2011 and before. Um, the uh, Syrian regime has been uh, changing some demographies of the country, the, um, the uh, uh, Kurdish forces, but also we have other military groups, Jabhat al-Nusra and others. So everyone is a changing democracy. So if we make a map, a new map, uh, 2011 and now, it would be totally um, different. And, and that's um, related to the cognitive science, how people feel uh, as Syrians when um, another person come and take over his home and how they perceive them. This is a very, um, 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 very important question to the people themselves, to the individuals and not to the groups. Um, um, here, uh, before I, um, I, I go to the conclusion, um, another important factor here, which I have been working on in the last year is rebel governance. And, and, and it's much related to the identity. Um, and, and, and when we discuss post-conflict, and power sharing and identity in the, in 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 in, in country like Syria, there is um and and the, the, there is a persistent evidence that rebel governance leaves a lasting impact on civilians' identities, and um, and this is important. What 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 are the 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 service provision by rebels and militant groups usually implants a consciousness of de facto statehood related to the people identities, and that's. Uh, when we talking about post-conflict, we need to take that into consideration. People already have been changing their identities. I give you an example. In Kobani, 65% in, uh, of people answer that their identity has changed uh, after 2014. So uh, there's a simple. In conclusion, um, we have here 
identity um, is not as the same. It's changing. And rebel governance affect identity. We have a very low trust, um, generalized trust, but also trust within the institutions. Um, how we can rebuild the trust and in order to, to have a lasting peace. But one thing is to, to related to the judicial system, a transformation and justice. People have to feel that they are safe again, and that will never happen again or never again. Um, and, and that's very uh, uh, important to the people um, themselves. Then uh, CSOs, civil society organization. There is a need for um, a very active civil society organization in Syria. Before 2011, there wasn't, um, and, and there was some here and there, but it wasn't an, uh, in, in the meaning of active civil society organization. And then we needed equality and people need to be treated equally as a citizens. Um, and, and, and that's where we can then start talking about power sharing and lasting peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was excellent and uh, awesome time. Uh, brilliant. Uh, I will uh, hand over to uh, Bilal uh, from Safer World. But before I do, just to say, if you haven't already seen, um, we will be going to Q&A session after the end of this. Uh, so please do pop your answers in, your, your questions to be answered in the Q&A function, not in the chat, uh, so that we can pick it up at the end there. But uh, hand over to uh, Bilal from Safer World. Thank you, Adam. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. Um, I work for an international conflict prevention organization called, uh, Safe, called, called Safe World, specifically with the MENA team, uh, where we currently focus on Yemen. Basically, our work is we partner with local civil society organizations and support community initiatives, especially those led by women and youth, to respond to issues arising from conflict. And then using such local evidence of, uh, of local level peace building, uh, our advocacy work tries to shift policy away from securitized and militarized responses to uh, conflict. So. Back in 2016, I wrote my master's thesis on uh, ethno-religious power sharing in Syria as a possible post-conflict institutional design. Um, and the reason I chose the topic at the time was first, back then, that outcome seemed to be a serious possibility, uh, but also because while studying, I increasingly can see the whole framework of power sharing settlements to quote-unquote deeply divided societies as deeply problematic, especially as that framework was being, was being applied to uh, Syria. Being a Syrian myself, I just found it very frustrating to see how the narrative uh, completely changed um, and where things have just gotten to know since the 2011 revolutionary movement. So I want to show how such a power sharing system completely failed to uh, or fails to address those aspirations and actual drivers of conflict. But also importantly, I wanted to show how such an option came to be through the roles played by um, external actors in particular in, in the conflict and how such an option would cement such external influence in a post-conflict Syria, which I'll try to do again today. So as you all know, and as Dr. Rapp also pointed out, the dynamics of the Syrian crisis has been severely complicated with intermixing of regional and international interests. Along with how the Syrian regime chose to deal with the uprising, uh, this external involvement had a huge effect on shifting political discourses and mobilization along ethnic and sectarian lines. We had uh, Russia getting the regime's discourse of war on terror, of foreign conspiracy, supporting jihadis and protection of minorities. You had Iran mobilizing its sectarian militias based on the same grounds. And you had Arab and Turkish support that went mostly to conservative and Islamist elements of the uh, opposition, which then sanctioned an anti-Iran discourse with a sectarian undertone and also mobilized uh, for, for example, Turkey's conflict with the SDF in Northeast Syria as fighting terrorist uh, separatists, which aggravated Arab and Kurdish tensions. And I won't go into further details of how that sectarianization process took place. A lot of been on it. And for those interested, I'll just refer you to a recent paper titled Sectarianization in Syria, that's integration of a popular struggle by Sami Hedaya. But mentioning, I'm mentioning this to point out that this whole external sectarianization process came with money, with media platforms, arms, and international baggage. It's just been so overwhelming to alternative liberation discourses and mobilizations. And it completely marginalized early youth and progressive political movements that didn't necessarily align with such regional agendas. And this then closely tied the sectarianized context through foreign countries' promotion of their sponsored actors to regional and international dynamics. And then on the diplomatic and mediation side, this context was met with an international community that is used to just bring out identity-based power sharing as a standard post-conflict settlement. This was then reflected on the political process and, institu and su suggested institutional sol solutions. And given how the political process has become so hegemonized and shaped by external actors' interests. Having said that, I don't think a clear cut ethno religious power sharing system for Syria, as the one in Lebanon and Iraq, uh, is going to be uh, likely. I think it's been gaining less traction in policy circles in 
recent times, also because the regional dynamics have changed, especially with the between uh, previous opposition backers like Turkey and Qatar on one side and Saudi UAE and Egypt on the other. It doesn't exactly align with that clear-cut uh, Sunni Shia regional binary that you had in previous years. And also because the power balance on the ground has changed with the regime regaining control of most, most of the country. Also, the words non-sectarian governance are explicitly mentioned in the Security Council Resolution 2254. Uh, but still, it might seep in through little details, like, for example, how groups are represented in political talks or how members of any future agreed governing body might be, uh, might be chosen in it. It's things like uh, the Russian drafted constitution back in 2017 that allocated ministerial positions based on proportion of ethnic representation or things like a U.S. State Department official uh, once being quoted in an article saying Syria's post-conflict political system would be, quote, a power-sharing arrangement just we ended up with in Iraq with Alawite presence and Sunni representation. So this just shows the framing and understanding behind the approaches to finding solutions to the Syrian crisis. And it's worrying because this reading is among the few common understandings around which Russia and the U.S. Uh, could actually agree on for a political solution. Um, and here I don't want to deny that uh, there is tension and there is lack of trust that has been aggravated uh, between Syrians belonging to different social groups, and perhaps this should be reflected uh, somehow in any future social contract or in a, con in a constitution, but my point is it shouldn't be made the most dominant sociopolitical marker in a way that prevents any sort of alternative political discourse and organizing. Because such an arrangement just doesn't capture the root causes and drivers of the conflict, doesn't respond to the unchecked oppression of the Security Bureau uh, and the closing of half a century of political life in Syria, or the corruption and mismanagement of the, of the economy, or the, or the complete neglect of justice and, uh, and, and accountability. And by providing continued incentives for sectarian ethnic mobilization, it just reproduces the same clientelism and nepotism uh, that exists within the regime today. And it closes space for opposition politics based on actual political and economic programs. And this is what the recent protests in Iraq and Lebanon are, sh are showing us. Um, in the series previous event in Lebanon, we had a guest speaker, Dr. Ibrahim Halawi from Motinun Motinat Fidola. He said that the Taif agreement uh, actually froze the conflict, but it didn't resolve it. It just changed the conflict arena from a fight in the battlefield to a fight over state resources. Um, something else that the Taif Agreement did, which is very relevant to Syria, uh, is how legitimated external countries' role in, in the conflict, particularly Syria's control over uh, Lebanon. And the similar arrangement will cement external influence into Syria's future because of how tight sectarian conflict dynamics are to those actors' actors' involvement. And the factors for that to happen are all already there. You have Russia pulling all the strings and has complete hegemony over Syria. You have Iran and its allied foreign militias having a significant presence and social influence across the country. Uh, Northern Aleppo uh, is under the de facto Turkish administration, growing hugely uh, close socio-economically to Turkey and distant from the rest of the country. And even on the political process, you had names in the current constitutional committee that had to be approved by the tripartite, Russia, Turkey, and, and Iran. Even inside regime areas, we can see how militiamen and warlords, including people with foreign backing, are making their way into local politics and gaining seats in parliament and parliamentary elections. So to conclude, um, where does all that leave us given, given the current, uh, current, current reality? It's been a decade since the 2011 uprising. The country is divided into areas of different control along frozen but very fragile front lines. The current political process with the Constitutional Committee is practically dead. Um, tens of thousands are still detained, forcibly disappeared. Half the population are still dis displaced from their homes. And the whole country is really exhausted, especially with the dire economic situation ongoing. If we go on with the previous paradigms and, and approaches, things will only get worse. Ultimately, the solution won't be with the mere signing of a peace deal. It won't be with the mere rat ratification of a new constitution or whatever institutional arrangement, power sharing or otherwise fits this case. Um, there's a whole transformation that first needs to take place, that regains people's rights to go back home to live in safety, that rebuilds trust and confidence between people, gives spaces to heal and recover from trauma and recover people's, li people's livelihoods. And then a formal political process that ends with, ends with a new social contract and governance system that could build on such a transformation. But it shouldn't be created from the scratch among the select elite or political actors based on international interests that then trickles down unfitly to society. It won't work like this. Um, and besides, the regime sees it as the upper hand will resist any attempt to political change as things currently stand. So what's needed is to actually interact with the current realities on the ground and try to shape new alternatives and new dynamics that could then open up new possibilities. Um, you could use what leverage you have with sanctions and with aid to get tit for tat on relieving issues like rates of detainees or the return of refugees with security guarantees. 
you could try to understand the dynamics currently ongoing in places like Dara, Sueda, or Damascus countries where the regime is really being undermined, and see how you can open up civil society spaces in those areas without without applying harm to them, of course. How you can check some of those conflict dynamics there. You could build capacities in non-regime non areas to show how alternative forms of better governance in uh, Syria can be made. You can explore how you can open up the country to each other, socially, economically, with civil society cooperation, even possibly linking governance uh, services in different areas of control. And instead of power sharing, you can think of power distribution, explore if you can encourage certain powers to be distributed to local community committees, for example, uh, to act on things like uh, coordination with central authorities or distribution of aid or facilitation of public, ser public certain services, just like putting the seeds for any sort of decentralized authority in the future. You can just a range of tools that could try to change these dynamics that would get a political, a political solution closer and more importantly, a political solution that's just more connected and relevant to people's realities. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Bilal. Um, and thank you for sort of throwing in some, uh, what I think will be the start of some, some important discussions about what, what it is that we can actually do uh, in terms of to help try and influence from the outside in a positive direction. Um, I'm delighted to hand over to, now to Alison, who has uh, been sort of leading on issues relating to Syria in Parliament for some time now through the Friends of Syria group. Thanks very much. Uh, since 2016, uh not because I chose to, but because my friend Joe Cox was murdered. That is why. So um, uh, I have since Joe's death been the co-chair with Andrea Mitchell, um, MP of the Friends of Syria group in the UK Parliament. And um, it's been really great. I want to thank the Foreign Policy Centre and CEPAD for this event. It's been really um, great and important to listen um, to uh, uh, to Rahaf, to Abdahadi and to Bilal. Um, they've given a really uh, thorough, I think, discussion and testing of the um, issues relating to Syria and the complexity of the conflict. And I am not going to speak about those things because I am not um, a uh, uh, foreign policy or um, a conflict specialist in that way. But what I do want to do is to reflect some of the work of the all party group, just to spend a few minutes talking about um, the UK perspective on, um, on the conflict. Uh, the kind of the journey that we've um, come, but particularly thinking about some of the, uh, the failures of responsibility to protect, um, or, or at least the kind of shift away from that. Um, and then some thoughts about what the priorities should be um, for those who are um, in UK policymaking circles, um, really responding to the contributions of others uh, as much as anything else. Um, I, I think this uh, point is very well made that I think uh, I have described um, uh, the kind of the dynamic in Syria, the kind of new Cold War um, that is there. And I mean, I remember very, very vividly um, in the uh, 2010 to 2015 parliament, um, other parliamentarians talking about um, responsibility to protect in, in a way that really prioritized that, that concept, that idea of the humanitarian imperative, not one side or the other, but the humanitarian imperative. And um, I think, you know, that obviously we have seen complete and utter failure in, in, in relation to that idea. Um, if you look at the Syrian conflict, and that is really has been the backdrop to everything that the All Party Group um, has done and said uh, since since that time. So we have consistently asked the UK government to pursue a strategy that put that humanitarian imperative first. That said that the biggest risk was to Syrian civilians, um, particularly um, in my view, to children. And that whatever the UK government did, however it acted, whether that was uh, whether diplomatically um, uh, or using other means, um, its substantial uh, aid budget, um, whatever it did, it ought to put that humanitarian imperative first. And I think that um, the second point, I think that there has been a significant problem there because, um, and this is, I speak personally, I can't speak on behalf of all the members of the um, all party group, but I think what has been lacking, um, particularly more recently, is the uh, is the idea of a strategy that the UK are pursuing. What is it that we're trying to achieve? And clearly, that, that strategy should 
in some ways come out of the kind of broad foreign policy view that the UK government has. And clearly with Brexit, change, uh, several changes of government personnel, um, the shift from um, uh, the Cameron administration through to the May administration and the Johnson administration, you know, we, we've seen, I, I would argue, we've seen a, a lack of strategy overall and specifically um, in relation to Syria. And we're still, so we're still asking for that. Um, in, in recent uh, discussions with, um, with the minister, um, he spoke of sanctions and use of other tools. I guess the question that I personally would have is, please tell me overall what you are trying to um, achieve. There is numerous ways in which the UK can have influence, so, some of which have been, been discussed. Um, I think it would be a good thing for the Foreign Office to consider which those ways are and to what end and to come up with that comprehensive um, strategy. We hope to hear from um, the UK Special Envoy as an all-party group very soon, and I'm confident that that is a theme that will be pursued. Coming out of the kind of Brexit hangover, what is the UK strategy uh, to foreign policies in the Middle East and to Syria specifically? Um, I, I, I think that there is certainly a role for aid with, within that, given the absolutely dire circumstances that many Syrian civilians um, and I say again, particular children face, there's absolutely clearly got to be a role for aid. And it has been extraordinarily disappointing to see that the kind of global Britain vision so far has included um, the shift away from the 0.7 target from the UK and uh, cutting aid, um, you know, which aid may well have fallen anyway under that measure, because as if given the size of recession that we have had, you know, that, that may well have been a consequence anyway, but to do it as a matter of policy rather than a consequence of, ac of economic fortune seems to me to be a complete mistake. But even given that role that, that um, aid can importantly play, I, I wish that it was in pursuit of a broader humanitarian strategy. I think that there's um, a second vital role that the UK um, can play, and that's in relation to um, justice. When my colleague as co-chair of the All Party Group, Andrew Mitchell, was Secretary of State for International Development. He worked on um, a, particular, a particular unit and set of civil servants to pursue these questions um, of uh, international justice so that the UK could play its full role in gathering evidence, in maintaining that evidence, and in mobilizing its legal expertise so that uh, through whatever legal avenues are open, the UK is able to play a role in um, bring, bringing whatever cases might be possible forward. And I think that plays to uh, one of uh, uh, Bilal's suggestions about trying to use different, um, different modes to, to pursue this, even if, even if there's no straightforward answer. And this is my final point, and I, I just want to reflect one, one last point about where I think the UK um, has, an, has an important role to play and uh, a theme that has been part of the all party parliamentary groups work. And that is um, UK based Syrians um, uh, and uh, their absolutely vital um, role in forming the, an important part of the diaspora community of Syrians, but also the very, very long standing role that um, British Syrians have played in, in our national life. And I think that this is a story that is not, is just not being told in the way that it must be. Um, I think that since the beginning of the conflict, I think that the, the importance of um, the, the voice of Syrians themselves, and I say this self-consciously as a woman from Merseyside, the voice of Syrians uh, has not been consistently heard enough. The, the long-standing community in the UK, not least in the academic world, has not been recognised, and I think that has got to change. And I think that the UK government could play a much more um, forthright role in making sure that our Syrian uh, diaspora in the UK is, is leading on uh, what some of the options are for the UK and how, and how that 
um, how that strategy should be formed. I think the UK could play. I think the the, the UK government could play a role in supporting and facilitating those those conversations. Um, final point as part of that. Throughout the whole of the conflict, much of the um, parliamentary debate in on on Syria has been um, on, on the issue of refugees. And um, whilst that's not the the main subject of the of the discussion um, today, I just I just wanted to uh, reflect on that. In that, um, I think that the way that the UK has approached um, Syrian refugees has not served our reputation globally well. Now that is something that would be absolutely disputed by conservative colleagues, um, but but I think the record stands that, that our approach to welcoming refugees from Syria. Um, it was not the right one, and it's not the right one now. Um, that this is an important question as we see the renewal of the UK's um, resettlement program very soon. Uh, and again, it's another. This is just another side uh, where I think that the UK government generally and policymakers specifically need to make sure that Syrians in the UK are being seen to lead um, on on this discussion and be heard. So. Um, that said, I, I will finish there, but um, thank you for um, asking me to be part of what has been a very informative thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, so we've got lots of questions coming in, um, and I'm not going to expect uh, ask all of our panel to answer every question. What I'm going to try to do is pull together a few different threads and, and, and take them in some broadly thematic bundles, but that may well all fall apart very quickly, so apologies if it does. But I will, I will try and read out a couple, and then we'll go to go, go back to the panel, and you can answer um, what bits you feel most relevant to you. Um, I think there are a couple of questions that, with a regional dimension to it, and the first question we had from uh, Ayadal Rafi was, the control of external actors over the crisis in Syria doesn't add to more possibilities of achieving peace. In other words, these actors arrived to a regional framework, uh, so if, if these actors arrived for a regional framework, would this be applied in Syria? And to what extent external agreements can work, rework the social political fabric of Syria? Um, one of the other questions that I thought was, yeah, again, uh, what role does what role has Israel had in the uh, Syrian conflict? That was from Josh Engel. Uh, we've got a question uh, of, uh, where was it uh, about the Iran situation? We had a question uh, about uh, to what extent uh, resolving relationship between the international community and Iran was uh, was relevant for this. Uh, so yeah, that was from Tom Walsh. He said, "Do the inter do the international community and the Gulf need to rethink its review of Iran in order to affect proper peacekeeping or humanitarian results in the long run?" Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a there couple of regional ones there, and I, and I appreciate we've had a conversation which has obviously been focused absolutely rightly on centering Syrians in this, but I think it's it's just it's probably just worth knocking this sort of regional dimension uh, through very briefly just to, before we can can, can we centre on that. So, uh, does anyone want to come in on any of those uh, dimensions? Uh, and as it unhelpfully, my uh, mouse is frozen. So if if if, if someone wants to come in. Uh, they can. Uh, who wants to go first? Rahaf. I will go first, but I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert of international relations or regional dynamics, but what I can say as, I mean, uh, after like, uh, uh, I mean, uh, observing the Syrian conflict so far, that the, the, the problems with the regional dominance or in the last 10 years since uh, the, the, the break of the uprisings in 2010 in the, in, in, in the Arab world uh, is that there is no hegemon or regional hegemon uh, uh, that kind of can lead or in Initiate uh, or enforcing enforcing peace. So we had at the beginning of the uh, uh, of the theory, uh, of the uprisings uh, that broke in, in in the Arab world is that that there is a more of a clear competition or rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and then uh, the, the 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 regional dynamics change to to be more of rivalry between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and then uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey. So this has been changing all the time. So um, and I think this is also related or, or reflected in the in the lack of 
uh, global hegemony of that the U.S. has lost its uh, hegemony or, or being or acting as a hegemon, uh, where it is kind of there is more of, as I said, that there is a, a new introduction, uh, a, a reintroduction of, of, a, of a Cold War uh, that is between, uh, I mean, the, the, the Russia and, 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 and the U.S. Um, I cannot say, I mean, Israel, and, and this can, of, I mean, this answer can bring me to, to the second question, which is I, I, the role of Israel and, and the recent uh, peace deals and how uh, these peace deals can impact actually uh, uh, the Syrian conflict. In a way, these peace deals can actually further entrench uh, the rivalry uh, among these Arab states. Uh, and also interact the conflict even more. So I don't see that um, in the in 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 I mean um, in the near future that we can solve this by uh, depending on regional uh, dynamics, but rather as Alison has just said that empowering civil society empowers Syrians diaspora in America and and UK or or in Europe where they can initiate. Or, or, I mean, actually um, mobilize their efforts uh, by uh, focusing on, on, uh, on, on, or leading European policies and American policies to change or uh, enforce. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, listing uh, Assad as a war criminal. Thank you. I'll hopefully meet myself. There was actually also a question related to that that I wanted to bring into this. Uh, into this bit, which was also, and you can answer this as well. Do any of the parties in the Syrian do any of the parties in the Syrian conflict regard any country as a trusted neutral actor? I don't know if, if, if Rahaf, you had anything on that, or whether any of the others who want to address this issue um, um, want to bring that in. So, so, so uh, please feel free to uh, anyone else wants those ones, but I just wanted to make sure that was in this bucket because it seemed a, seemed a, a relevant one. Have you? Uh, does anyone, anyone anyone else want to come in on the regional dynamics, or, or we can move on to um, the other bits? Okay. I mean, I'll just say very sorry. Yeah, please do. I'll go. No, no, just say very quickly. Like, uh, yeah, because I'm also worried about like, not uh, wanting all this the whole discussion to be on regional regional dynamics. Like, just to say that the best buffer for um, countries trying to oppose other countries' regional influences inside Syria is just to promote more um, courses and mobilizations based on actual, uh, like based on actual interests and based on actual needs of Syrians, because these are the most popular in the end. Uh, political actors promoting regional agendas are just a minority. They're an elite that uh, you know hold certain interests, but when you actually just promote and uh, widen areas and avenues for people to pursue their self determination and you know, have uh, actual popular politics. This is how we actually insulate and push back against regional influences and agendas into, into the country. So I think that's just central even to a regional discussion. Brilliant, thank you. Um, anyone else wants to come in on that? Shall I move to, to some other things? Okay, I will move to those. Um, we've got some questions uh, about different types of groups that might be able to play a helping hand. Um, so uh, Quentin Oliver asks, uh, can you expand on the role of women and civil society organisations in human rights, defence, community building and peace building? Bottom up pressures often help bring leaders to the negotiating table. Uh, that's so from Quentin Oliver from uh, Thrasham International. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, here about the role of the diaspora and we talked on that uh, very briefly. Uh, so if, if anyone wants to, to elaborate a bit more about how the diaspora can play a, a role in helping people come back to the the table. Uh, and I'll also just address, there's a quite a long question at the start from Josh Broadhurst about, um, that says, so the argument from most people is that power sharing is the best solution to the situation in Syria, where Alawites, Sunnis and Kurds have some kind of stake, but power is shared between the multiple actors in civil war. However, I don't think he's obviously picking up what, what a number of you have said, bringing those extreme, so, oh, you're not hanging, bringing in those extreme factions like al Nusra into any power sharing agreement, uh, would be embedding extremist factions in the system, and if if point what if that isn't sustainable, uh, is it sustainable to leave those factions out of the conflict? Um, so um, yeah, so 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 what it, so what solution is there to create a stable state power sharing amongst moderate faction 
whilst extreme extremist factions still exist and still have an influence in parts of Syria. So we've got two positive dimensions, women's civil society organisations and diaspora, and then these specific issues around uh, more extremist groups and where they fit into the broader picture. I can come on the women question actually, and and I wanted actually to say a little bit about the role of women in uh, in, in the Syrian conflict. Um, and actually, I mean, one thing that I can say is that despite that, women have suffered a lot uh, uh, because of the war. But but this work actually opened also the space for or the the platform for women to mobilize themselves and have a, a kind of a very serious and strong position in leading uh, the political process. I mean, I've been in. I mean, I, I am in touch with. A great woman, a great Syrian woman, uh, Syrian feminist, actually, where they are um, in part of a big movement, feminist movement, leading uh, the peace process, and they are trying their best to be part uh, in the in initiating peace or leading uh, uh, the, and, or, or, or leading the. I mean this kind of transitional period, if we have one. Uh, but at the same time, women are, while they are playing a, a good part, but they are also facing many challenges because of patriarchal society, uh, uh, that, that being, uh, we have, we are, they are also um, facing smearing campaigns uh, and shaming campaigns because they are uh, being more exposed or intervening uh, publicly uh, against uh, these kind of uh, patriarchal processes uh, imposed uh, by some political parties or, or parts. So women are trying their best, uh, Syrian women are trying their best to, to, to have a role in, in initiating peace or leading peace, but at the same time there are, uh, and here it comes also um, where uh, global or, or external actors or, or US and European uh, governments can play a role of empowering mo uh, more women uh, to have uh, an effective role or an active role in, in, in leading uh, the peace process uh, forward. Um, so this is just for just my intervention for uh, the women question. Thank you very much, Rahaf. And yeah, if anyone wants to talk about that or, or more broadly about the role of civil society uh, or the diaspora, please do. Can, um, can I just um, please, yeah. butt in, Adam, and, and, and really support what uh, Rahaf just said? Um, so um, it's a kind of uh, it's one of those truisms of um, of of UK politics that particularly whenever we we discuss conflict anywhere in the world, even very close to home, um, it's very broadly acknowledged that women are absolutely crucial to um, peace building and in rebuilding post conflict societies. But their contribution to that work is at the same time in the specificity of it almost entirely overlooked um, and not discussed in the um in the kind of high level um policy making um, areas so my conclusion from that is that it's absolutely the responsibility of uk politicians of whatever party to um to try to, to try to address that, to consistently fight for a seat for the table, a seat at the table for women, and also to consistently remind um, all in you know the international community that women who do participate in those efforts and women who do step forward um, will often pay an extraordinarily high price for doing that. So the protections for them must be. Um, at the for, for for all the reasons that that Rahaf uh, just mentioned, and and I think that this is this is a uh, problem that's uh, broader than than Syria. But in the case of Syria, actually there are um, very significant individuals um, in in the UK diaspora who who consistently talk um, on this subject. So I think that this is where I see an opportunity for for the UK in facilitating and um, this discussion and making sure that those um, these point these well understood points about um, uh, the way that the impact that conflict has on women and as I keep saying and on children uh, that that we are that the kind of constant voice on that. Thank you, Alison. Bilal or 
Yeah, just coming on the point about civil society uh, was um, when I was mentioning in my uh, inter the intervention about the alternative discourses that were marginalized at the very beginning and the progressive movements that were that were marginalized. A lot of those people that were that occupied those uh, spaces uh, have transitioned into working as part of civil society organizations and NGOs that have grown over the past years. So these are the spaces in which they're uh, working out, and the work that they're doing is. Uh, uh, brilliant like the headlines usually cover uh, the main the major conflict dynamics and the roles played by different actors but they've really been uh, been able to play a huge role on the ground in at least alleviating the you know economic situation alleviating um, uh, their uh, livelihoods um, documenting human rights by uh, human rights abuses by, uh, by 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 all parties and just looking at for example certain uh, things like the work that has been done, been done on accountability by civil society organizations has just been really strong um, so this is really a space that uh, could and should be so, uh, supported, but it also should be mentioned that civil society has been uh, suffering from uh, closing of space over the, over the, over the past years uh, by the conflict actors within the areas they work in, but also because of a shortage of funding um, and because of the lack of attention that's been deviated away from Syria over the past years. Um, and so like the giving space for civil society could be, uh, I was mentioning about, um, for example, conditionalities or like leverage of what things can be pushed for. So the size space would be something that's opened in order to change some of those conflict dynamics that could open up for a possibility for a, for, for, for a political solution. Um, I just want to connect that quickly as well to the diaspora, because uh, there was a question in the Q&A about, you know, well, if space is really being closed and like, for example, in an area like uh, Syrian regime areas, how would you expect the society space to actually work and, and, and do something? Um, and especially that sometimes external funding comes with a little bit of harm and you know, ex ex exposure that comes to their dis, uh, to their dis disadvantage. And that's something that Syrian diaspora could actually play, play a huge role in. Like they're connected through uh, networks and through connections that is able to channel and support and is able to even offer a better understanding and analysis of the dynamics of the conflict areas. So yeah, this is something that Syrian diaspora could, could actually play, play a role in. Brilliant. Uh, I, I also have something to say about Please. civil society organizations and, and, um, and the trust. Um, one of the um, determinants of uh, generalized trust uh, in, in any society is trust in civil society organizations. So um, viable civil society organizations um, in Syria is needed and is a, necessary, a necessity to, um, um, to increase generalized trust. And that's because the um, mechanism of, of um, bet between the people and, and, and the, the uh, formal states need the civil society organization to increase political participation and political participation, considering that Syrians have been uh, denied political participation in pre-2011 in political parties. And now the rebuilding of humans um, in, 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 in the uh, political uh, sphere as political parties, as well organized the groups um, uh, engaged in politics, it needs civil society organizations. Um, but having said that, there is a very um, negative aspect if we um, uh, uh, only rely on civil society organization, because as in Lebanon, so many civil society organization will be hijacked by elites and hijacked by uh, al-umara, al-hurub, which means that each one has his own uh, NGO, which is the UK sometimes fund um, uh, fund Lebanese uh, uh, civil society organization or Bosnian civil society organizations or even Palestinian civil society organization based on their ideology um, and based on personal connections, and and that's what in, um, what would. Um, uh, contribute to the uh, nepotism and patrimonialism and corruption within the uh, uh, the society. So, um, just I mean, I mean when we 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 talk about uh, civil society organizations, I think there is a question about that later on. Um, it, it, it's not only at a seat that we go to the doctor and tell them that you take this pill and that's it. No, it's a civil society organization is one determinant among many other determinants. You can't just tell, okay, this is for um, uh, to increase the trust or to um, to, to make people see, feel more safe and, and secured. But then what? But people before 2011, uh, many of them felt safe and secured, but they didn't have any rights. or uh, 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 They were not treated equally, for example. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Um, I've got a couple more questions about types of people who could potentially be involved in peace building. 
Um, and there was a question from Ayad Al Rafi uh, talking about uh, may you talk about can you talk about the role of prominent families in Syrian cities and influential tribes in the East and other parts of the country can play in the process of trust building, or do you prefer to stick to an institutional approach relying on what is left of the Syrian advance this process? And then uh, someone else has talked about what does the panel consider to be the role of faith leaders in civil society initiatives in relation uh, to this? Is there anything? Um, Anything sort of in terms of tribal or faith groups that would be relevant in terms of bringing people together? Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. No, go ahead. Have... No, I mean, I, I just have, I mean, in, in, thanks, Iyad, for asking these in, interesting questions. But like, I just want to say that, I mean, I think the leading people now at the, at the time being is that, and, and this is linking to what Alison has, has talked about, about the role of the Syrian diaspora in Britain or in Europe or in the US, where Syrian think tanks, something that Alison is, is well aware about, which is a written rebel society, you know, uh, have worked, I mean, closely with MPs in the, uh, in Britain and British MPs were like, I also were, uh, I used to send emails with my uh, with my fr with my friend uh, Yasmin Nahlawi. I mean, trying to lead uh, 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 or or to kind of act, have a more of an act uh, that the UK should have a more of an active role to end uh, the Syrian civil war. I think this is partially. Um, these think tanks who are or the Syrian diaspora empowering the agency of Syrian diaspora is really important. Now, in terms of the second uh, question, which is about faith leaders, I personally uh, think that mediation through faith leaders is not the solution for the Syrian war because of the entrenched sectarian uh, uh, division that we had in place now, uh, whether the sectarianization is being imposed from the regime or kind of the different external actors such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, or other actors that they are sectorizing the Syrian communities. I don't think faith leaders uh, will, in, will lead to peace, but rather more or less divide societies and actually build not a kind of a, a state or, or a political system based on civic notion of citizenship, but rather bringing us back to a primordial uh, belonging, which is more or less a very emotional tribal sectarian, which will also emphasize the sectarianization of the Syrian communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm not quite an expert about what the rule about how faith leaders in, uh, uh, in Dara are not actually playing, playing um, what they are playing a role, but also they are uh, um, actually, I mean, minimizing uh, the chances for Syria to have transitional justice and a more or less, a, a more or less a robust political system uh, and the strongest state where uh, uh, where institutions of or justice institutions and um, can actually lead the process forward rather than going back into uh, sectarian leaders or faith leaders uh, into uh, having the power. Uh, or, or the rule of oligarchy and the elites again to 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 shape the politics of of Syria of the future of Syria. Thanks. Thanks. Um, anyone else want to come in? Yeah, um, I, I think the question of of uh, Iyad uh, to me uh, about the uh, tribes, um, and I think um, the the question has two um, points. Um, the one one thing is um, a tribes has been always um, exploited by the regime since the 50s so it's not they have been always and until today being um uh, used um and and say having said that there is two aspects one the trust between um members of one tribe towards each other it's an informal trust they have a kind of informal understanding or, or let's say um, informal agreements between the pen, uh, penal code of the tribe itself. And, and that's why they keep in between themselves some kind of the blood relation. Um, and, and that's one thing that can hinder them from ha harming each other. And there is a lot of incidents actually in the, uh, during the Syrian civil war about how members of one families uh, um, attack other members of another families, but then the, the same tribe of the person A has punished um, the, the, their members because they didn't want to engage into tribal conflict. But the different political um, and militias and militant groups have attracted many uh, of these tribes. 
and and for for example many of al qaidat wal baggara or adwani wal adwan in the in the north they still have been used also as they have been used in 2003 by the regime against the kurdish forces um and they were actually given weapons and at that time so so these kind of things um i need, need to be um uh, taken from the point of view that if we need to again use the same mentality of exploiting the tribes again into politics then what's the point of having equal society what the point of having uh citizenship um uh, or treat people on the citizenship notion of citizenship so um abandoning it is a very important but um uh, 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 i think um the the it's the, the, reg the regime or any post conflict regime would uh, face a very high resistance from the tribes thanks Anyone else want to come in on these bits? Oh, okay. Um, there are a couple of questions about sort of regional and local issues. Um, so uh, I think Anonymous was, uh, was, was asking, what role could decentralization play in a future Syria? And how should Syrian regions and communities have more control of their destinies? And would this solve any of the grievances that Syrians have had with the power of the regime? And relatedly, he was interested in, in more information about the devolution of power to local communities that Bilal talked about in terms of whether any of that was happening already. Um, and um, there was also a question about sort of recent regional developments in uh, Dara and al Sweda, And I think there was a, there's a couple of other sort of regional based questions that are in, in, in the chat if anyone wants to address them. Um, I can come yeah. quickly on the decentralization point uh, like basically the whole trajectory of the conflict since 2011 up until now has like really had a strong communal component to whether it was with the local coordination committees that were formed to the then local councils that were that that were established and even during the so-called reconciliation deals that were signed you had a huge communal uh, component that is even now following up on like the the different details of those of, of those agreements um so the thing is that i think the because of the regime and the whole external component uh, try to shape the dynamics in a way that they really compartmentalized uh, dynamics within localities uh, that like did acquire a strong a strong communal a strong uh, communal aspect to it um, and the seeds are already there for uh, you know today for example uh, when the local coordination committees uh, sorry when the local um, uh, negotiation committees that were part of the reconciliation these negotiate with the with the they negotiate on things like the release of detainees on like certain property rights for citizens um so there is sort of this mobilization around uh, uh yeah around uh, the around communities and you know the seats can put uh, can can be put there for any sort of a social arrangement to be uh, to be built, built on that um the point uh part particularly about around sweda um i don't think like there needs to be outright support for example from the uk to those uh, committees because you know that would just give some probably harmful exposure uh, but uh, as I said, like these, they have certain demands that could be picked up by countries and any uh, um, conversations between countries within uh, each other, they could be connected to the political process itself. Uh, but currently it feels like all these different committees are having their own demands and they're, you know, working in silos. Um, and they're just trying to have whatever levels they have within their uh, communal dy dy dynamics of the regime. And they just could have, uh, they could have more support from uh, outside. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else want to come in? Um, Adam, perhaps if I may, um, just to um, just to give my apologies. Unfortunately, I have to go and join a, a an important local call. Um, but uh, just to say um, thank you for asking me to be a part of the discussion, and thank you to everybody for their questions and participation. And it's been a very excellent and informative panel. Um, and I look forward to. Um, working with all my fellow panelists, um, and as does the all party group uh, as we move forward. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Alison, for your input. That's really, really, really important. Um, that's excellent. Um, okay. Um, unfortunately, we, we, I, was, I, was, I was saving some of the questions about the UK government's role to the end, but, uh, but Alison already chipped in a number of a uh, number of ideas there. Um, did anyone else want to come in on those sort of regional questions or? I think so. I, well, which we've got uh, 23 more questions to try and get through. I will do my best to uh, pick out some of those from that. I will head to those then. Um, there was a couple of couple of things about individually named people here, and and I think obviously, um, 
uh, it, so some, someone asked, is Moisin al khatib still involved in, com in, in, in the conflict or, or in uh, efforts of peacemaking? Um, Rich Andrews asked about the long-term impact, so the impact of while he was still alive and, and anything since of, the, of, of Qasim Soleimani on sectarianism in, um, in Syria, what role did that play? Um, and uh, yeah, sort of other, so anything else about sort of people who are sort of helping or uh, under, uh, sort of helping stir sectarianism or undermining it? Is there anything on, on those issues or? I can I can't come on. Did you say Muaz al Khatib was his name mentioned? Oh, okay. I mean, I'm I'm not quite. I mean, he played a quite important role at the beginning, but then he quit. I think, or uh, I'm not following actually what he's doing now. But uh, uh, leading the peace process, I mean, I, and I think part of why he Muaz al Khatib quit is that he he thought like uh, there was a kind of an hijack of uh, the Syrian uh, uh, agency or, or or the Syrian will. Uh, by uh, regional powers. This is the reason why uh, Maaz al Khatib stopped in, in, in leading uh, uh, for the, the peace process forward or, or, or the political talks. Um, can I, I mean, what was the second question about? Uh, it was about, about the impact of Qasem Soleimani yeah. and, and sort of yeah, Iranian they, policy in, 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 in influencing. Um, sectarian dynamics. Yeah, I mean, what is important about the Iranian foreign policy is that it's not really personalistic in terms that it's the death, of, the, the death of Qasem Soleimani, which means that the, the termination of or the end of Iranians uh, kind of strategic policy towards a certain country. So I don't think the death of Qasem Soleimani changed or altered uh, Iran, the Iranian sectarianized uh, uh, or sectarian intervention in Syria. So um, no, I'm actually, I don't think Qasem Soleimani's death has really changed uh, um, or transformed or shifted Iranian foreign policy. Uh, uh, I mean, it kind of warmed the hearts of the, the Syrian hearts when, uh, because he, he had led some uh, uh, committed atrocities against Syrian communities, um, but it did not really change uh, the, uh, the, the, the kind of the, uh, the, 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 the overall spectrum of sectorizing the conflicts as imposed by Iran. So this is my uh, answer to that. Thanks. Anyone else want to come in on it? Okay. Okay. If uh, if not, yeah. So just uh, there's a number of people in the chat trying to uh, asking about uh, being able to speak themselves. Unfortunately, the mechanism for this is a webinar, which means there is physically no way to bring people in to speak directly on it, um, because it, with the number of people who are involved in it, 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 it does it does it just gets unmanageable if it was set up separately as a as a sort of uh, coalition of 100, 100 different people on screen. Um, so apologies for that. And obviously when we're able to meet in person, that, that those opportunities will will come again. Um, but um, so wanting to just pick up on some stuff that um, people have been talking about. So uh, Dana Bashir has asked about um, the role of uh, UK or other international com uh, or countries' uh, weapons sales to Syria's neighbours and to what extent that has fueled the conflict. And um, a lot of Syrians would be uh, thankful for no additional bombs dropped under RTP in a no-fly zone, uh, which would have cost even more lives. Uh, so it's interesting on what, what, the, what the role the impact of a, of a no-fly zone would have had uh, on the situation. Um, and yeah, so, so some of that, and then other roles about international, other things the international community can do. I think there's discussion about uh, the role of the ICC. Do we? Does anyone think that a potential, you know, criminal charges at the ICC is or could be a factor in determining what Assad does, or does he feel that he's insulated uh, from that process by um, by his 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 his, his role there? Um, either of those issues, uh, arms sales or ICC. Anyone? Okay. Adam, do you mean do you mean ISIS or what ISIS? I, ICC, the, the International Criminal Court. Oh, okay. Sorry. Basically, the possibility of external legal action okay. against him in the medium to long term. You know, would be, I think the questioner was asking whether that would have any effect on what's going on on the country now. 
Yeah, I mean, I think yes. I can answer this. I can answer this briefly. Uh, I mean, I think in um, in U.S. there is a, a, a well-known think Syrian uh, well well think tank. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's led by Mohammed Abdullah, who is like also bringing to justice uh, some of uh, uh, criminals who commit atrocities against Syrians uh, in the prisons, in the regime prisons. And there was also a recent one in Germany. So this can actually really play an important role in bringing uh, Assad uh, uh, to the to the crim to, cr to the criminal court. So of and this brings us back to the role of Syrians diaspora, uh, and that by activating and strength strengthening their role, uh, we can have actually empower the Syrian agency on the one hand and actually also uh, uh, initiate uh, peace not imposed by uh, sharing powers uh, among world leaders, but actually bringing those who commit atrocities uh, to the court and help having a transitional justice. And not repeating the scenario of uh, the Taif agreement in Lebanon or the Indian models, where it's actually did not strengthen communities, but, but rather actually stop cosmetic, cosmetically uh, the, the civil war, but, uh, but then uh, weakened, uh, weakened and divided societies more. Uh, I would also take something here on, on, on this topic uh, as well. Um, well, um, in, in Bosnia, as um, maybe uh, my friend, my colleagues um, uh, last week uh, spoke about, that there is some success when it comes to the ICC and the Bosnian atrocities, um, but it's not yet completed, it's ongoing. And I, I see that um, the, the, the time of the, um, in, in the 90s and then now it's totally different. Um, and what's happening now in Europe and out, uh, outside Syria is different than inside Syria. And I think the question is more related to in Syria about the regime, the Al-Assad and his family and so on, which I find it's very difficult because we have Russia and the international system, we have to be very um, uh, uh, honest with ourselves that the international system is different than the 90s. The, uh, um, when there is international and, and big powers between Russia, Europe and the United States, who decide the fate of the Syrian people and the Syrian and Syria's uh, future, which is unfortunate, um, and and that's why I would say that um, there is um, the, the only way now is the Syrian in diaspora is to focus on persecuting everyone who committed any atrocity against them and outside Europe. There are many of them, and they could just uh, run after them and and bring them to the courts. And then after that, when the time comes, um, there is opportunity for judicial. Uh, um, transformation of justice uh, one day, um, maybe one day, um, uh, if this is the regional powers um, exchange their um, uh, ideologies or the um, stance when it comes to the Syrian uh, uh, regime. Is there, is there a role that Magnitsky sanctions either by the UK, EU or US could play? I have just very few things on this, and maybe Rahaf knows much better, but I think the Syrian people are paying the right, the price for that, not, not the regime. The people, the normal, the, uh, the people. So, sorry, you know, the Magnitsky sanctions, the personal sanctions on individuals, not on... Ah, okay, I'm not aware of that, maybe Rahaf, but I mean the, the recent wave of sanctions last year... Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, yeah. in, you talked obviously you talked about these international courts not being able to reach people, but the question is, do any of the people still attached to the Syrian regime have any assets that are in Western capitals that could be subject to personalized sanctions through uh, the Magnitsky mechanisms? I mean, definitely UK can play a role in this. Like we have, uh, I mean, as my as that their the, her family is in UK having like. Uh, owning many things in London. So, I mean, and I think there was a campaign led by Syrian, British Syrian diaspora, by Rethink Rebuild Society. Uh, and, 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 and I have many Syrian friends who led that kind of uh, campaign to, to actually, um, I mean, um, and, 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 I, I, and I remember in 2016, where I was uh, meeting MPs to actually think about, uh, um, um, Stopping that, that asking the MPs to to see that the Fawad al Akhras, uh, Asma al Assad father, that has um, li direct links with Assad regime, were 
uh, they could have uh, put him on um, or imposed sanctions on him, but nothing was uh, done. So I think, yes, uh, the EU uh, and US can play uh, a great role in imposing sanctions on uh, uh, on some politicians or or, or Syrian personnel who are have direct uh, uh, um, contact or direct relations with the Syrian regimes, um, which also can help uh, um, the Syrian people in 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 and in, in leading uh, to to establishing peace. Yeah, and there might be scope for some Russians and other other conflict party parties to be to be, be considered in that broader framework. Uh, Bilal, is there anyone, is there, not anyone, is there any, anything that you think um, more could be could be done um, from the international community side to help? I mean, just to say on the on the like, question of the ICC, um, like the lack of accountability has been a constant theme throughout the conflict. And I think, you know, at every stage of the conflict, the more that uh, different conflict actors, especially the Syrian regime, uh, the, the more that they see a lack of accountability to certain actions, the more that these actions are further aggravated and they develop, you know, from uh, shooting protesters to then bombardment to then use of chemical weapons, all of that. So it's definitely been a constant theme. And uh, unfortunately, we've, you know, uh, as, uh, as Abdelhadi pointed out, we've just seen how justice has been very selective within the international system that we live in. And it requires like a sort of consensus or agreement by uh, UN Security Council members to, you know, to have that uh, selective uh, justice. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, any sort of accountability, even uh, that faced towards certain individuals would be good as a form of pressure, uh, but uh, just still, uh, it's just important to emphasize that it doesn't replace the need for a full-fledged transitional justice uh, process where not just like individual actors, but uh, within communities uh, can can heal and, you know, have sort of, sort of truth commissions and pro processes where people can just open up about past atrocities that, that have happened and, you know, find ways of mutually living living uh, with, with each other again. I think there are, I think, sort of three questions, really, to, to end on. Um, uh, Rosemary uh, uh, in, 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 uh, Charles, about what would a grand bargain look like? What, 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 what might be a potential, so, uh, so, you know, um, what are the, sort of, are, there, are there any big, big, big things that could bring people to the table? Um, a number of people have talked about the level of exhaustion on the ground in in, in Syria. So, so in terms of after you know ten years of, of conflict, is is what can is there anything that can be done to help re-engage people who previously you know understandably uh, moved back from uh, from this type of engagement uh, because of the realities of things? And then there's one difficult question to answer at the end um, from Josh Engel. Uh, is Syria still a viable country? Um, so, uh, three questions rather. So, is there is is there any hope? And can you? And if so, how can you get people to engage on the ground? Are, are there any other sort of big picture tools that we haven't been talked about already that we can we can we can address? And ultimately, at the end of things, is is Syria still still viable? Rahaf. Yeah. Okay. I mean, first of all, I mean, this is all my vision, my theoretical vision and coming from an academic perspective. So uh, I'm not someone of, of uh, an active one on, on the ground, an activist on the ground. But like what I mean, as, as, as laid in my presentation, I totally disagree with power sharing because this will bring on the table a warlord sharing uh, uh, rule, which will bring us back to, to 50, 50 years uh, brings us back to where um, the Syrian state came into existence after the independence. So, I mean, I don't think sh power sharing is will build a lasting peace, but rather more or less entrench uh, the conflict and lead to, divided, to dividing societies more. But I think there is something about um, leading uh, a revolution from, from below uh, by empowering people to out, overthrow the regime by not asking for a political change, but asking for uh, a certain um, by having um, a more or less uh, widespread uh, demonstrations against uh, uh, the against the regimes. Uh, um, I mean, the, because the regime now is facing this economical crisis, so. Uh, by having uh, these Syrian demonstrations uh, uh, bombarding the Syrian street, uh, streets, the regime can be weakened by, uh, uh, by, by such demonstrations. So instead of uh, 
instead of having uh, the, 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 the banner again of the 2011 to overthrow the regime, the regime can be weakened by uh, saying that they cannot provide for their, uh, for their people. So, uh, uh, so the economical crisis can be a window uh, uh, to weaken the regime uh, rather than uh, having a power sharing. Um, unfortunately, there is no a kind of a magic solution to the Syrian conflict, but we are in front of a very protracted conflict that can stay uh, for the next uh, five or 10 years. So uh, instead of, uh, of empowering uh, uh, these uh, warlords, uh, empowering Syrians inside Syria and having uh, a more of uh, activating their voices uh, in diaspora and also inside by weakening the legitimacy of the regime. I think this is uh, the way forward. So thank you, Rahaf. Which, uh, whichever of you would like to go first. Okay, I, I, will, I will go uh, first. Um, I, I think, um, as, as Rahaf, I disagree totally with the power sharing mechanism in Syria. It doesn't work anywhere else, like in in in, in Bosnia in post-conflict settings, and it will not work in Syria. And it's more complicated. Now it is after 2011 and after um, uh, 10 years. Now I think Syrians, um, despite we see them that they are fragmented, they have um, um, and and so um, they are more fragmented than ever. But they have um, been politically engaged, and they understand now uh, what politics mean. They practiced it um, by weapon and by pen and papers. So, and, and, and that's a very important aspect. Um, I, I see Syria as a one country and people um, uh, should be empowered inside Syria um, uh, by uh, civil society organizations that I mentioned before, by person in the, uh, um, uh, personal uh, 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 initiatives and, and so on, but also by connecting people inside Syria with people outside Syria. People now, Syria has a big number of in, in diaspora and usually diaspora play a major role in rebuilding the country in material and non-material and that's a very important aspect um, um in in terms of 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 the um power in in um in, in uh, uh north uh, uh east uh, syria the kurdish autonomous areas i think um sooner or later uh, then the syrian regime will take over that part of the country and and then also the um the in in in, in Jabhat and Nusra and others. Maybe it takes time, yes, of course. But um at the end, um, I, I believe that the Syrians have to look now. Um, and I'm, I'm not Syrian, but I'm, I'm I feel myself as Syrian. I mean, there is no difference between Palestinians and Syrians. Um, and I I'm, I I think uh, to, to 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 start looking at how we empower the people of Syria in Syria, and 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 that's. Uh, one of the major aspects, but also to pay attention that the fragmentation in diaspora should be um, uh, uh, diminished as soon as uh, possible. So we, the, the, the focus would be in the country and not only outside the country to just to the efforts to be focused on one aspect. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and Bilal, the last word. Just want to agree quickly with uh, Dr. Raf and then Dr. Abdelhadi. Like there, there is no grand, uh, grand bargain, and I think this is the wrong approach that's been taken over the past years. Is that there is always the search, you know, with certain agreements between regional countries and just having that international consensus that can then trickle down as a political solution. That's not the way to go. And as uh, Abdelhadi was just describing, there's a whole process that needs to take place to allow for the conditions to just improve uh, the situation, and then uh, possibly a solution would follow. Um, on the question of whether Syria is still a viable country, uh, um, like I think in, in, in the country's weakest moments, life continues to uh, exist and society still uh, can continue to, to, to exist and people existed in this area before there was even a creation called uh, Syria. So, um, I mean, if, if, if the question is about how functional the state is, obviously it isn't. And, uh, you know, there needs to be improvement to like services and whatnot. But, uh, but yeah people will still uh, occupy these areas and uh, the area will still be in, in, in inhabited then. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for your uh, contributions. Thank you so much to everyone who asked a question and has stayed with us to the end. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We had so many uh, there uh, to try and uh, try and get through. Um, the final um, uh, meeting in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this series that we're doing jointly with CEPAD is taking place uh, next Tuesday, that's March the 2nd, uh, focused on Yemen, uh, and we are joined there by 
uh, Maisa Shuja al Din, who is the uh, non resident fellow at the Salana Center for Strategic Studies, uh, Professor Simon Mabin, who is the director of the SEPA project, uh, Nadir al Dosri, who is a, a non resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, Kate Nevins, who is a long standing um, uh, peace building activist, uh, and Wayne David, who is the shadow minister for Middle East, will be chairing that event. So that's taking place next Tuesday uh, at five uh, till six thirty, like now. Thank you very much, everyone, for staying with us, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in future. Thanks so much. Take care.